Welcome to Conversations. I'm Bill Kristol, and I'm pleased today to be joined by an old friend, uh, Diana Schaub, professor of political science at Loyola University, Maryland, uh, author years ago of an excellent book on Montesquieu, on the Persian letters. Uh, you've turned your attention more in recent years. You still do the political philosophy, but to American things, and the co-editor of a terrific anthology with Amy Cass and Leon Cass, What So Proudly We Hail, which people should buy, and there's a website where you can find uh, poetry, speeches, fiction about America. I, I particularly like the holiday, or, organized by holidays. So for July 4th, you can read July 4th appropriate material. So thank you for doing that. It's excellent. And thank you for joining, joining me today. Glad to be here. And we're talking about Frederick Douglass, whom you've written on uh, 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 very interestingly. Um, so you should tell us about Frederick Douglass. Well, Donald Trump actually gave Frederick Douglass some publicity. Uh, this is <laughs> little, I wanted to have this yeah. I wanted to have this conversation before Donald Trump reminded the world of Frederick Douglass's existence, which I think he did in February, right? When he said, "What did he what did He said, "Frederick Douglass is an example of somebody who's done an amazing job and is getting the recognition more and more." I notice it's a little unclear that yeah. the president knows exactly who he is, but. You agree with that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, he, uh, he led an amazing life, yes. uh, and uh, he could still be doing good work today. In other words, Donald Trump could be right if, uh, if we spent more time reading Frederick Douglass, reading his uh, speeches and writings, his autobiography, uh, a little more attention to his life and achievements, uh, would mean that we could say, uh, you know, he's doing good work and getting okay, more well, this, attention so this, for it. This so. conversation will vindicate the president, <laughs> so that's good. No, I, I mean, I myself had a vaguely, of course, favorable view of Frederick Douglass, you know, very impressive man, escaped from slavery and all, but I had no idea of the depth of his thought and the kind of complexity of his statesmanship, I guess we could call it, until I began to study it a little bit when I taught in a year or two American political mm -hmm. thought and then really read your work and the work of one or two others. I guess that Herbert Storing uh, wrote uh, on, yeah, on Douglas Storing decades ago. Yeah, uh, wrote a book, uh, a collection called What Country Have I? Uh, and that phrase actually comes from Frederick Douglass. It's in one of the speeches where he reflects on whether it's possible for a, uh, for a slave or, the, uh, or a, freed, uh, a freed black in America before the Civil War to be a patriot. And he poses that question, what country have I? Uh, and Douglas says he feels like he has all of the emotional equipment to be a patriot uh, if he could reconcile himself to his country. So, I mean, in a way, part of the value, I think, of Frederick Douglass is that he shows how one can develop an intelligent patriotism uh, and how one can think about the founding. I mean, part of him becoming a patriot is... Uh, his revisiting the founding, revisiting the Constitution. Uh, he has a kind of evolving view of the of the founding and the Constitution. Okay, well, let's, we can walk through yeah. that. But I know what I taught, yeah. I just cribbed from Storing's essay, which the students hadn't read, so that was how, <laughs> that was how I was a successful <laughs> professor in my first year of being a professor, but now I can crib from your essay, so it'd be even, be even better. Okay, so walk us through Frederick Douglass. Say a word about just who he was and when he lived. Uh, and well, um, well, we don't know the exact date of his birth. Like most slaves, uh, there was no record of his yeah. of his birthday, and he talks about what that means uh, to not have that part of your identity. But he's we now know uh, born around uh, 1819, uh, born as a slave in Maryland on Maryland's eastern shore. Um, he, I mean, we could talk a little bit about. I mean, what, so he gives an account of his. He, he writes as a, a narrative. Youth. Once he fl successfully flees from slavery, he writes the narrative. And he flees when he's what a teenager. Uh, he's about twenty or yeah. so. Yeah, when he so he spends his youth as a escapes. slave. Yeah. Um, Teaches himself, as I recall, to read. Uh, yeah, and write. I mean, I just, it's an amazing he's, story, he's right? Obviously, a remarkable individual from from the beginning. So he hears his master raging uh, that, you know, if a slave learns to read, that would forever unfit him for slavery. Uh, and he says it's from that moment that he understood the direct pathway from slavery to freedom. Wow. Uh, so he had already been receiving a little bit of instruction from his mistress, who was a kind-hearted woman who had never had a slave before. And he expressed an interest in, the, in, in books, and she started to instruct him, uh, and then the master intervened. So interestingly, he says he thinks intervenes he to stop inter intervenes to stop the lessons, uh, and he says that he thinks he owes as much to that proscription 
from the master as from the kindness of the of the mistress. Why? Because uh, it uh, be- because it made clear to him what the sort of foundation of white power was. It was the denial of education to to blacks. Or so he es- he, so he escapes from slavery. So he well he he first uh, you know uh, uh, frees his mind from ignorance by learning to read. Uh, right. He kind of uh, tricks his white playmates into sharing the secrets of the alphabet with him. Uh, his master turns out to be right. Uh, his acquisition of of literacy makes him sullen, uh, makes him aware, even more aware of the wrongs that are being done to him. Uh, He gets hold of a copy of a book called The Columbian Orator, which is a collection of great speeches from, you know, Englishmen, Americans, uh, uh, this celebration of liberty, and he he masters all all of that material. Uh, so that he does become. That was an important become, book around the uh, yeah, founding, it was a, it right? Been, a, yeah, it would have been a book that would have been used in classrooms. So that's how he got it. A primer. So that's amazing. So he begins yeah. by reading these speeches yeah. of George Washington or Edmund yeah. Burke or whoever, right? I mean, yeah. 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 Uh, but he becomes increasingly sullen as, as an adolescent, and his master uh, eventually hires him out to a man who was known as a slave breaker. Uh, that's what you did with truculent youngsters, you had to break their spirits. And so he's farmed out for a year to work with this fellow, uh, uh, Edward Covey. And uh, he's, this is really the first time in Douglas's life that he's been exposed to the sort of full rigors of being a field hand and exposed to the lash, regular whippings. And he, he says, I was becoming a brute. He was being brutified by it. Uh, but a particularly terrible beating kind of recalls him to himself, and he resolves to resist. The next time Coey comes at him, he's not going to allow himself to be whipped. So he's about 16 at this point. Uh, remember, he's a big fellow. He's six foot four. Uh, wow, <laughs> that is inc- incredibly, incredibly strong and impressive uh, physical person. And uh, he engages in a two-hour hand-to-hand fight with Covey. Wow. Uh, and e- even there, you can see his sort of prudence. He doesn't go on the offensive. He simply fends Covey off, but that could entail, you know, holding him by the neck and uh, you know, kind of, uh, re- refusing to be caught hold of. Uh, Douglas wins that battle in the sense that Covey was unable to get hold of him and unable to whip him, and Douglas was never whipped thereafter. Wow. Uh, so. And Douglas has this remarkable reflection on what that meant. He says, from that moment forward, because of the spirit that rose within him, he said, I was a free man in fact, hmm. though I still remained a slave in form. Hmm. So, I, I mean, I, I think reading Douglas can really let us know something about the, well, you know, what, what freedom really means, that it is a spiritual condition as much as a physical condition. Now, this is in a, in a narrative. I mean, he then writes later this is in versions, the, yeah, but in this the is narrative. in every writes pretty soon after he becomes free, right? I mean, uh, it, well, um, yeah, within a, within a few years. I mean, he, then he's 20, he, he escapes from slavery, he goes to New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, sort of gets hooked up with the radical abolitionists, with the Garrisonian abolitionists. He eventually becomes an agent for the Garrisonians on the lecture circuit, you know, kind of telling about the horrors of, uh, horrors of slavery. Uh, and his development as a speaker is so rapid, his learning becomes so deep and profound that people begin to question whether such an individual could really ever have been a slave or not. Oh, is that uh, right? Because you know, usually what the former, you know, they were recruited for the abolitionist lecture circuit, right. and what they were expected to do was kind of show your scars and talk about the horrors of slavery. And in fact, his sort of white mentors instructed him, better have a little of the plantation speech. It is not best that you seem to learn it. Wow. <laughs> so Douglas starts to chafe at the paternalism there. Uh, and... But in a in a sense, some of the abolitionist concerns were confirmed because people began doubting that Douglas had ever been a slave. So he actually writes the the narrative in order to prove his his uh, his, his bona fides. Yeah. So and he, that's around 1845. I 18, think, yeah. Like so that. he names names. He names his former master. Wow. Remember, he's a fugitive slave. That leaves him exposed so to capture. So even when you've gone to the free yeah. states, you yeah. can, you 
or it's safe. He's, he's exposed to recapture, so he actually leaves the country. He spends two years in England rallying international sentiment against slavery. Uh, while he's abroad, English friends uh, purchase his freedom for him. They contact the old family and arrange uh, for Douglas to become a free man. The, his friends, the Garrisonian abolitionists, objected to that uh, because that makes one complicit in slavery. You're Paying acting the, as if the, someone really did own yeah. Frederick Douglass. Never even uh, thought of that. I mean, I've read that story about them buying his yeah. uh, freedom. But that's actually now the Garrisonian abolitionists. I mean, they are so their point of view is uh, abolition of slavery, obviously. Right, but uh, I mean, but calling for an immediate end to slavery and doing so through the reform of the individual conscience. So the Garrisonians rejected any kind of political action for the reason that the federal compact, the Constitution, was a tainted document, tainted by the original compromise with slavery, uh, and therefore it ought to be annulled. No person of good conscience could consent to hold office under it. Uh, could he, no person of good conscience could even consent to vote under hmm. the Constitution. They went so far with this as to say that even if by your one vote, slavery would be overturned, it would be illegitimate to cast that vote. Hmm. So the Garrisonians show an extreme concern for the purity of the individual conscience. They want no contamination with slavery, no compromise with slaveholders, uh, and they called for the annulment of the, of the Constitution. And so Douglas is speaking as part of this movement, and it's, so it's sort of a proselytizing, I mean, it's a, not religious exactly, but proselytizing movement in the sense that there's no actual political <laughs> right. agenda there's, to pass yeah, this no, law or that no law. There's no party, there's no, right. not, no political party, nothing like that. And yeah, so Douglas is a faithful Garrisonian for yeah. a number of years. Uh, but after he comes back from England, uh, he resolves to launch out on his own. He relocates from Massachusetts to New York, to Rochester, New York, and he founds a, a newspaper, The North Star, uh, that will be entirely run by, by an, an African-American. Uh, he thinks it's important that African-Americans take the lead wow. in the abolition struggle. Uh, and once <laughs> he's sort of relocated, uh, and maybe also because he's not quite so thrilled that the Garrisonians <laughs> weren't happy about the purchase of his freedom. I think he begins to think some of the tactics of the abolition struggle. He also comes in touch with the Liberty Party, which is located, uh, sort of centered in New York. Uh, they, were, they were political action abolitionists. They believed that you could work through the political system for the reform of slavery. And that difference really hinged on the evaluation of the Constitution. So the Garrisonians read the Constitution as, an, as a pro-slavery document, in the same way that the Calhounites and the Southern Slavocrats did. And the political action abolitionists read the Constitution as an anti-slavery document. So Douglas then throws himself into that debate. And this is literally a party, the Liberty Party. That I mean, is a party. A third party, the yeah, equivalent third, fourth party, whatever. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he, it, it really is quite fascinating. I mean, he spends a two-year period really struggling with this issue of what's the right way to read That's a up. text. And he, he sort of invites the Liberty Party man, well, tell me about your rules of reading. You know, I, I want to understand how to approach a, a, a text. Uh, can we really understand this as, a, as an anti-slavery document or not? And as you go back and look at, I guess they have the records of the Federal Convention at that point, but uh, maybe not quite, but the Federalist yeah, Papers certainly. And yeah, although the position that he comes to following Lysander Spooner is that you don't consult those outside sources. It is oh. the text and only so the text. I think he's a real originalist or whatever, textualist, <laughs> yeah. I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, uh, he's eventually persuaded that this is the correct interpretation. Uh, and I think his reason for switching and is what's not the just say, there, so. uh, that, that, that the Constitution is an anti-slavery document. Which, and made I, and I think comp is, which made reluctant compromises with slavery. I mean, um, yeah, actually, the Spooner position is that there are no compromises with slavery in the document. So Spooner reads the absence of the word slave or slavery from the text as an indication that it's not there. And so if you take a 
passage like the Three Fifths Clause uh, or what we what we call the Fugitive Slave Clause, Spooner said. No, it doesn't refer to slaves. It refers either to resident aliens or the Fugitive Slave Clause refers to indentured servants who have signed a contract and if they skip out on mm. that contract, they can be obliged, they can be returned to their, uh, to their overseers. So Douglas, I think, is interesting because he doesn't go down that, completely down that route he is prepared to admit that there are some prudential compromises with slavery in the text. But through a kind of discriminating interpretation of the founders' intent, he believes that they did not accord any moral sanction to the idea that there could be property in man. Um, so, for instance, about the three-fifths clause, he argues that what that actually does is to deprive the southern states of two-fifths of their right. natural basis of representation, uh, the full which would just be the full yeah. population. Yeah. And remember, free blacks were counted in full. The distinction is not a racial distinction between black and white. It's a distinction between slave and free. So it prevents the South from having more power. From having more in Congress, more power in the than, House. It, than yeah. it otherwise would if you'd gone by the natural standard. It's funny of it was today, isn't it? I mean, if people just use the three fifths clause as a st talking point, almost to see it's a you know yeah a, a denial of black humanity. Right, or but a, it's as a practical yeah. matter, it was the most they could do to. Yeah. Make it more likely that slavery would be limited, I suppose, and or reduce the political power in any case of the states that were already slave states. Yeah, so it's, you know, so there again, going back to Douglas, and he, he then, you know, writes these pieces, is the, is the U.S. Constitution pro-slavery, anti-slavery? And he takes you through all of the hmm. passages and gives you the analysis, and uh, so it's a, it's a great resource. And this is happening kind of early 1850s, basically? Uh, yeah, most of that writing about the Constitution would be during that time. And, uh, and, a, and a final sort of summative statement in 1860 that he makes on the Constitution. And meanwhile, in American politics, uh, there's the Scott Prize of 1850 and then Dred Scott and all this. So the uh, political dynamic is going the uh, other way, I guess one would going say. Going south, yeah. Going south, <laughs> very, so to speak, yes. Very quickly, yeah. And uh, D Douglas, you know, of course, is denouncing all of those things. But there's also that there's always this side of Douglas. You can see it in his reaction to the statement from his master about you know, you, you shall not learn to read. Uh, Douglas takes all of that heightening of the conflict as uh, as positive in a way, hmm. uh, because he believes it will hasten the day uh, which the end of slavery will come. And he's but, a major figure at this point, or pretty yeah, major. He, he, I yeah, mean, huge. well known. I mean, uh, yeah, as, people... an, as an orator, uh, he is uh, the favorite of the day. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, this is a time when Americans had a nearly gluttonous appetite for oratory. Right. Right? There were right. no screens. There were no other right. uh, forms of entertainment. Uh, you know, a three-hour three-hour speech would be uh, would be fairly routine. Mm, Think like of the uh, yeah, yeah. Lincoln Douglas debates. That's the other Douglas, Stephen right. Douglas. Right. Uh, so yeah, Fre Frederick Douglas was was immensely popular, and he went on speaking tours throughout the nation, uh, in many places, of course, encountering. Uh, the resistance of mobs, um, and is he? Uh, he meets other leader, political leaders, and so forth, or um, not so much. Or it's more well, like a se maybe separate. Not so much because the abolitionists are still not, you know, quite radical. Right. I guess he can't uh, go to he's Washington. Not, he's right. not within party politics. Uh -huh. That changes a bit during the war. It's, itself when, so he in has, the 50s, when he has meetings with Lincoln. I was going to say, so in the 50s, Lincoln is leading the opposition to Dred Scott, and, this, and there's the debates yeah, with Yeah, as Douglas, the Republican and, Party he is, is born, uh, yeah, Lincoln begins to come to the fore within the Republican Party, but uh, Douglas is not, Frederick Douglass is not a Republican. Huh, uh, he is an abolitionist, and despite what the opponents of Lincoln are trying to say, like right. Stephen Douglas is trying to brand Lincoln and the Republican Party as abolitionists. They are not abolitionists. Right. Uh, they're opposed to the extension of slavery into the territories. Uh, 
they're anti-slavery, but they are not calling for an immediate right. end to slavery in the slave states. Right. Whereas Douglas is, he, as he says, he occupies the genuine abolition I ground. See. So he's not where Lincoln is and sort of we need to have yeah. the ultimate, whatever, what's the phrase, Lincoln, the ultimate extinction of slavery or yeah. something is the goal, but for now he's willing right. Lincoln to guarantee the southern states almost uh, not being interfered right. with, right? That's right. not Douglas's position. That's not Douglas. Uh, and in fact, we should maybe go back on, uh, say something more about his interpretation of those clauses yeah. in the Constitution that have some relevance to slavery. So he's he's prepared to read the three-fifths clause, the um, the importation clause, which is already now a dead letter, right? The international slave trade has been banned for the last few decades. Uh, he's prepared to read those in a way that puts the founders in a good light, puts the founders, you know, on record as anti-slavery. But the, what is called the Fugitive Slave Clause, that he cannot accept. And he reads that in the way that Lysander Spooner does, that it refers only to indentured servants. Um, the, the clause seems to have sort of implications of contract. A slave obviously hasn't entered into any contract. Uh, so I, I think Douglas really could not have looked favorably upon the Constitution if he thought it did obligate non-slaveholders to become complicit with slavery to the extent that they had to return runaway slaves. And is this Douglas's genuine view of what the founders intended, or his view of, is he saving the Constitution by reinterpreting well, that? Yeah, you know, I mean, you could say, well, isn't this sort of literalism, yeah. just a kind of semantic trick, but... I mean, it could be an important he, trick, but, you know. I, I, th I think he's sincere, okay. and he does go back and look at the records of the Constitutional Convention. Yeah. I mean, maybe you, there's basis for it. I don't know anything yeah, about Yeah, I mean, you, I have mean the, you have the Southern delegates, uh, Georgia and South Carolina, saying, we want a provision for fugitive slaves to be returned like criminals. That's the language they want. I see. And, you and they do, don't get that. You, you do immediately get a pushback, and you have people who stand up and say, well, uh, you know, we, we don't want to allow the idea of property and man into the Constitution. We're completely opposed to that. Huh. And then it disappears into committee. Oh, that's interesting. And then we don't know what happens, but we get something that comes back that now talks about persons held to service or labor, under the state laws thereof, we get this very carefully constructed That's clause. Yeah. And Douglas says it means that the people opposed to the idea of property and man won, and all that was given was a provision for the return of, uh, of um, indentured servants oh, who were held by contract. That's it. So it really was important to him to establish yeah. the principle that the Constitution was anti-slavery. Yeah, and he, he said it's a, it's a glorious liberty document and it should be wielded in the cause of emancipation. So I, I, th I think this is actually the point at, at which Douglas and, and Lincoln really disagree on the Constitution because Lincoln believed there was a fugitive slave clause and that there was an obligation on the part of Northerners to return fugitives. He considered it obnoxious, right? Uh, but it was the what was called the federal consensus or the the constitutional bargain respecting slavery. And in general, in Douglas's arguments against slavery, I mean, presumably it's not that hard to argue against for the, against the justice or for the injustice of slavery. But people have done it on different grounds over the at the time yeah. and subsequently. Uh, Declaration of Independence, natural equality, or Lockean grounds, you might say, or. Uh, John Locke or Christian Grounds or what was Douglas's? Douglas core? does all of those. <laughs> uh, is that right? Okay. <laughs> and, and really unites them: uh, uh -huh. natural rights, natural rights that come to us from a from a creator. Um, so he, yeah, he is in many respects a, a good Lockean, uh, and especially in his belief in the legitimacy of violence. If natural rights are being denied, then you are within your rights to resist with violence. But does he, in, the, in practice in the 1850s, encourage violence or simply um, stay Well, he sort of certainly thinks that for the slaves... It's legitimate. It's legitimate. Uh, he was a supporter of John Brown, uh, gave Brown money, hmm. consulted with him. Uh, he was not in favor of the raid on Harper's Ferry. He thought that was a suicide mission. He declined to participate. Yeah, that was wise. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, so for the slaves, he, he thought it was legitimate, 
But he goes farther than that, and this again involves the Fugitive Slave Clause. He argued that the friends of the slaves, uh, if an attempt is being made to return a fugitive to slavery, that it was legitimate to kill the kidnapper. So, so he's not, it's not that kind of, I mean, this is jumping a century ahead and fighting segregation, so it's not comparable, but there's not that Martin Luther King sort of uh, Christian turn the other, you know, yeah. turn the other cheek side so much to Douglas. Yeah. I, I, I mean, maybe he would have been, it was a century later and you were just dealing with I, yeah. discrimination. I, I think because of the lesson that he had learned from his contest with Covey, mm -hmm. that sweet reason is not always enough right. and that there has to be, um, you, you have to be willing to hazard your life for your liberty. So, so that, that's interesting too, I think, in his understanding of Locke, right? You have this threesome, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, but they're, they don't always go together. Right. <laughs> and Douglas understood that you have to be willing to put liberty before life. And in a way, that's how you prove that you're worthy of, worthy of liberty, yeah. is that you're willing to hazard your life. And so this, this comes through uh, very much in his, uh, involvement in getting African, first making sure that African Americans were accepted into the armed forces during the Civil War, and then actually taking an active hand in recruitment. So he took the lead in the recruitment for the 54th and 55th Massachusetts, oh, the, the, black, the black regiments, oh, wow. and he signed his sons up first, his two sons fought. Uh, so just to go back to the beginning of the war, so then the Civil War begins. Sorry, I'm going out of control. No, no, it's good, okay. no, no, it's, I mean, we're, to, but <laughs> at that point, Douglas, I mean, do these distinctions between Douglas and Lincoln and <clears throat> other kinds of abolitionists and sort of begin to disappear a little bit, and everyone's uh, I, everyone's yes, sort of on the same no. side. I, I mean, mean, he's he's interesting because he's it's you know in, we should vote for the Liberty Party, <laughs> but then I imagine when the moment came, he voted for the Republican. Mm -hmm. uh, so up sort of until the last second, he's saying we vote for the Liberty Party, but then uh, yeah. And is he tolerant of Lincoln's? Uh, bending over backwards, let's call it, to try to keep the union together and to reassure them that he's not necessarily... Not so much. Yeah. Uh, he heaps abuse on Lincoln. Uh, he's very disappointed in the first in inaugural. In 61, Yeah, 62. he's very disappointed in the first inaugural, which he thought contained way too much appeasement. Uh, he's not sure, even though the Republicans are anti-slavery, whether you can really look for very much to come from them. Uh, he's pretty rough on Lincoln until the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation. And that's the key point where, yeah. well, yeah. So, the, I mean, the, you know, the abolitionists are pushing Lincoln, you know, turn this war for the Union into a war for abolition. Uh, Frederick Douglass was certain from the beginning that it was, in fact, a war for abolition, that it would mean the end of slavery, and he wanted that to come about as quickly as possible. It did. I mean a little longer. And at that yeah. point, now then he meets Lincoln, um, he's, he's invited to the White uh, House. They do, they do meet on, uh, on about three occasions. Uh, Lincoln asked to consult with him. They, uh, he particularly consulted about um, African Americans being welcomed into the armed forces. So they, they talked about that. Uh, Douglas, at a later point, complained to Lincoln because, of course, the South was not treating captured black soldiers as prisoners of war. Uh, they were instead treating them as criminals and felons and returning them to slavery or simply killing them. So uh, Douglas asked Lincoln to retaliate in kind hmm. with Confederate prisoners of war. Um, Lincoln said he could not do that, uh, but he was, you know, willing to take other steps to... Say, I'm interested, I really hadn't thought about... Um I guess the 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 black uh, regiments was really an important. I mean, of course, one hears about them wow. in history, and it's the, their memorials to them in Boston and so forth. Yeah, but yeah. I guess I never really focused on how big a deal that was. Hugely important. Yeah. Uh, I mean, important to victory in the war. By the end of the war, there were two hundred thousand black troops. Wow. One fifth of Union forces were African American. Uh, and remember there. But, I mean, if you look, I mean, this is in a way the problem with what happened with the memorialization of the war after the war. Uh, the memorialization was done at the local level. And so all of the statues that were done were of local regiments, 
and those would have been white regiments. So there was very little acknowledgement in so statuary. So the African Americans were swept, so to speak, into black regiments. I mean, colored regiments. Yes, were, they yeah, them. they were. So they, they were not were, local. They were, no, it wasn't that's right. The they were. They were Boston segregated. Boston freedmen and the New York freedmen. It was right. all. I see. They were segregated, and they were in effect federal, uh -huh. not. That's interesting. Yeah. But that's important for Douglas that they fight, obviously. Yeah, for and the reason he thought it was so important is because he knew there was a belief, because blacks had been in slavery for so long, that there was either a natural or an acquired slavishness. And to shake that reputation, it would be essential that blacks not be given freedom. Hmm. Okay? You cannot be given freedom. Douglas knew that himself. <laughs> because he had, he had earned his freedom, he had conquered his ignorance by learning to read, and he had conquered his fear of death in that fight with Covey. So uh, the, 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 Douglas's favorite line of poetry comes from Byron. Hereditary bondmen, know ye not, who would be free themselves must strike the blow. Mm -hmm. So it was essential that African Americans fight, uh, and he thought it would be essential for their self-esteem and self-respect, and he thought it would be uh, essential for changing the hearts of white Americans, that they had to see that display of courage from African Americans. Uh, Douglas knew that America came to be in a revolution, in a fight for liberty, and the only way to right. sort of be a full American is to somehow partake in that or participate in that. Uh, it seems to me Douglas was also laying the foundation for the vote after the war, so it was part of his, was part of Douglas's reconstruction project uh, by fighting that would give African Americans a claim to the vote. In other words, Douglas understood that there's a difference between natural rights and civil rights. Mm. Uh, blacks had a natural right to liberty. That didn't mean that they had a a claim upon civic participation. So he knew that a different kind of argument was going to be necessary to, 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 to establish that. So you can point to things, you know, 200 years of labor in building the country and things like that, but you could also point to the service. And he's very life. active, obviously, in the fight then for... For the 15th Amendment. 15th Amendment. Yeah. yeah he's him... he's one, of the, one of the prime movers for the 15th Amendment. And then, of course... And it actually led to a little bit of a falling out between Frederick Douglass and his feminist friends. Uh, uh, because he had been early in the cause of, uh, of the vote for women. The first issue of the North Star had as one of its little tags up at the top, uh, right is of no sex. So he... Yeah, one forgets how... I don't one forgets. I forget. <laughs> maybe other people remember, you know, how early that... I mean, how much... How mixed up, yeah. in a way, the abolitionist movement and women's suffrage and women's equality was... Yeah. Was. And even other things like free love then. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so yeah. why was this an issue in the 15th Amendment? It was women didn't get the vote, just, just y Yeah, just because uh, the feminists were saying, um, what actually, about, what they about us, right? said it in a very obnoxious way. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, uh, we're not going to stand aside and see Sambo go in the door before us. Well. So it, it led to uh, a, real, a real split for a little while. Uh, although, interestingly, the, uh, the black female abolitionists stayed with Douglas, and they understood that it was more imperative for black men to have the vote as a mere matter of self-protection. Yeah. And Douglas, then I assume I don't know much about his post. I mean, so he's still a pretty young man in, in 1865. In his prime, really, yeah. during the during the war. Yeah. So he continues as the leading black spokesman for civil rights after the war, and for civil rights, for labor rights, for women's rights. And he's, of course, I'm sure, extremely unhappy when Reconstruction is is abandoned and various compromises are made to basically leave the South alone and abandon, really, the yeah. blacks of the South, right? I mean... Yeah, so the, the point that we made earlier about his willingness to countenance violence, um, you know, against the enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Clause, once you have the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, uh, I don't think he ever sides with violence again. Mm -hmm. He knows that you now... That the, that the law is the black man's friend. You have the law on your side. So he is terribly disheartened by things like the uh, 
you know, when the, when the Supreme Court uh, goes against, you know, strikes down the Civil Rights Act. Uh, but he says, we've been wounded in the house of our friends. Mm. So the, the, the speech about the Supreme Court is very interesting. He gives vent to that anger and disappointment, but then he sort of goes back and says, we've got to remember we operate through the law. So there's this very careful calibration you and know, he stays kind of that way through the 1870s and the very, I mean, he never is so embittered by what's happening that he turns yeah, against, I mean, he, the, he, he remains. This ebullient temperament, <laughs> uh, a confidence that the universe really is on the side of justice, that I, seems to see him through everything. Uh, I mean, one of his last great speeches is a denunciation of lynching. You no, know, I mean, things are getting very bad in the 1880s. He sees all of that. I guess he but doesn't he, see uh, Plessy v. Ferguson, though, right? He dies before that. Right, so yeah. That would have been yeah. really bad, right? Um, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, if I'm not mistaken, he, not having been that close to Lincoln and having differed with Lincoln, he then doesn't he give a famous speech uh, was it 10 years after the war? I don't know where he sort of yeah, reconsiders 1876, Lincoln. 1876, yeah. So, as I said, once you have the Emancipation Proclamation, he's, <laughs> he's yeah. much more uh, uh, generous in his uh, evaluations of Lincoln. And then, again, after the Second Inaugural, which his his description of the Second Inaugural when he met Lincoln at the uh, ser the reception afterwards at the at the White House... Uh, actually, may, that that story is maybe worth yeah, worth please. telling. No, please. So yeah. he uh, he uh, is invited to the reception. He arrives. Uh, they apparently don't have the uh, guest list in front of them, and they refuse to let him in. He tries to, as uh, friends, kind of bring him in through sort of you know open full full door window kinds of things. He's escorted out again. Eventually, someone tells Lincoln what's happening. Mm. He has to intervene so that Douglas is uh, is allowed entrance. He then comes through the receiving line, and Lincoln greets him and says, uh, "You're the man I most want to hear from. I want to know what you thought of it." Oh wow. And Douglas says, that was a sacred effort, Mr. President. So I, 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 th I think that really sums up somehow the essence of the Second Inaugural, that it was a sacred effort, an attempt to give an interpretation of the Civil War that would allow the nation to go forward on a foundation of generosity and magnanimity and, and charity. So uh, in every speech that Douglas gave after the war where he mentioned Lincoln, he quoted those lines from the second inaugural, the sort of divine reparation line, you know, if this war has to continue right. until every drop of blood drawn with the lash is repaid with another drawn with the sword, then, you know, right. still it must be said the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So it was those lines, I think, for Douglas, because it, it meant that America was acknowledging the sin of American slavery. Right. Uh, and the whole country, not just yeah. blaming the South. Yeah. So I, I think after the war that Douglas wanted to sort of use the memory of Lincoln and the words of Lincoln to keep America to that promise, to keep America on that track. Um, so the, the speech then that you started with, the uh, 1876 speech, uh, was an oration uh, in memory of Abraham Lincoln. It was given on the occasion of the dedication of the Freedmen's Monument, which was a monument, the first monument actually, uh, erected to Lincoln and erected entirely, paid for entirely by donations from freed slaves. Wow. So uh, Douglas was chosen to give the... Uh, the, and that's the, here. The keynote in, address. Uh, yeah, it's just about a mile, here in Washington, mile from here. Right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in that speech, I think is the fullest accounting that Douglas gives of how blacks, in particular, ought to view Lincoln. Uh, but it's given at a moment when, you know, Reconstruction is being abandoned, and I. Th I think that Douglas is trying to think about how you can use the shared appreciation of Lincoln as a way to bring the country back together. And he issues some updated versions of his autobiography, I think, uh, 
couple, couple. Yeah, a couple of times. So the narrative is just his life in slavery, right? Narrative of my life in slavery. Uh, a few years after his entry into the abolitionist world, he redoes the, the autobiography. Uh, he adds his abolitionist work into it, but he also goes back and adds a lot about uh, his life in slavery. And it's actually really quite interesting what he does, because the narrative is just a, a recounting of horrors, mm -hmm. right? the, 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 the awfulness of slavery. But when he goes back and rewrites those sections, he really tells you more about his own experience, mm -hmm. which is not just an experience of the horrors of slavery. In fact, Douglas's experience seems to alternate between a kind of rather privileged condition as a slave, like when he's in Baltimore uh, working for this, this family, uh, and, uh, and you know, the times when he's doing field work. Mm -hmm. So he's sort of going back and forth between a more privileged condition and a, and a really harsh condition. And in a way, it seems to be that that is the source maybe of some of his insights into into hmm. slavery and in and into freedom, but then yeah. these second and third editions—is there an edition after? There's the a third war? edition yeah. also, which is v uh, vastly expanded, uh, taking you know all the way up until the you know well after the, well after the war. And do you have recommendations yeah. to people as to which the second to read? One. Is that right? Yeah, huh. because it has more than the first, but it's the yeah. Some of the other stuff, you know, he, he was appointed uh, ambassador to Haiti and served as the marshal in the District of Columbia, and so he tells you about some of that. But that's good. Not, 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 not quite as interesting. And other speeches yeah. apart from the tribute to Lincoln. I guess there are several famous ones. Some of them on the What's So Proudly We Hail website. But uh, you have a particular um, t couple to recommend, or yeah, I, I think. The, the Lincoln one, the 1876 one, but also one from the early 1850s called What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. Hmm. I'll say a word about that. Yeah. So uh, that's given on July 4th. It is a most unusual July 4th address. Uh, it's not just the, you know, all celebration and self-congratulation. Uh, he views the 4th of July from the perspective of the slave. And this is in the 1850s, so slavery, I mean, pre-Civil War, so yes. slave, slavery exists. Yes, yeah, yeah, so yeah. he is speaking as a former slave and as the friend of the slave. Uh, his brothers and sisters are still in slavery. So it's a very interesting speech. It falls into, into three main sections. The first half of it is a wonderful appreciation of, of the revolutionary generation and the principles of the revolution. So he describes them as saving principles. Hmm. But then he says, but those are your fathers, and I leave it to you, <laughs> to you, the white audience, to, to celebrate them. Uh, he even makes this little comment saying, indicating that he probably has a blood connection to those fathers also, hmm. but he's not regularly descended from them. Hmm. Uh, Douglas, of course, was of mixed race. Uh, his father was white and is usually thought to have been his first master. But he says, all right, I leave it to those of you who are regularly descended from the fathers hmm. to celebrate their achievement. Then he shifts into an attack on the sons, an attack on the current generation. And he says, you are the ones who have betrayed the promise of the revolution. And it is an absolutely savage attack, trenchant, biting, vituperative, satirical, uh, just ruthless. Hmm. And that's the whole center section of the speech, of this July 4th speech. Then at the end, he shifts again, and he shifts not, not back to the Declaration, but instead to the Constitution. And he says, you've been told that your Constitution supports what you're doing. You've been told that the Constitution is pro-slavery. You've been sold a bill of goods. Uh, it isn't. It's a glorious liberty document. So it's a really interesting frame. You know, the attack on the current generation sandwiched between this appreciation of the Declaration and the Revolution and the appreciation of the, of the Constitution. So I, I think for students today, it shows them that you can be a patriot, uh, a real thoroughgoing patriot, 
uh, and that there is still this tremendous room for dissent and for critique. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, did Douglas have, I'm well, just curious about his own people who influenced him and then people whom he influenced. So, I mean, he obviously studied the founders and uh, were there other, I'm just curious, were there other authors? I mean, maybe he was more of a man of action and of contemporary controversy than sitting around reading you know, novels or Shakespeare or something, but were there others who particularly influenced him? Or? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, he's, self, he's entirely self-educated. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, he had this volume, The Columbian Orator. He remains a reader and a learner throughout his life. His self-education continues. Um, I suppose much of what he's reading are sort of the political pamphlets of the day and the sort of pamphlet wars. Right. Uh, he, he certainly sort of apprentices himself to Garrett Smith, uh, the Liberty Party, uh, and Lysander Spooner for his understanding of the Constitution and how you read, how you read a, a written text. Uh, if you look at the sort of allusions that he makes, it's, what's that, those lines from Byron, uh, Shakespeare, Is that uh, right? quotes from Shakespeare at a number of, number of occasions. Hmm. The Bible, or, I mean, he's... Uh, um, is he religious? Yeah. I mean, is he sort of a churchgoer? Or, well, or? again, he's um, bitterly denounces the church and the way in which the churches have become complicit with slavery. Uh, but he's clearly, you know, he's, he's always appealing to, to God, to right. providence, to... Yeah, so I, I, would, I would say he has a... He has religious belief or a religious temperament. Right. Um, but not, but, um, yeah. Um, and after, I mean, so he, I think, what does he die? I can't remember. Uh, uh, 1895. So right before Plessy v. Ferguson. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that morning <laughs> he spent uh, speaking to the National Council of Women, giving them a speech on women's rights. Uh, <laughs> came home and uh, died of a heart attack. And his influence, I mean, uh, I mean, we can now recapture, and we'll talk about this in a minute, mm -hmm. about what lessons we can learn from him and we should learn from him and study him. But afterwards, did it fade some? Was he very much alive as a figure in African-American thought and in American thought generally? Is your, do you have an judgment? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think he does disappear. I mean, he, he wouldn't have been taught in schools. He would not have been part of the curriculum until more recently. But uh, I think he was always important for African-American uh, figures. So you can see it with Booker T. Washington. Uh, Booker T. Washington talks about how important it was for him in his own education that there was that model of Frederick mm. Douglass. Anytime anybody told him, well, those avenues are foreclosed to you because you're a black boy, uh, he could always say, well, what about Frederick Douglass? Mm. Uh, so he remains so, a huge figure in the African-American community, despite all yeah. the arguments with Du Bois and Washington and stuff. And, but not so much. Yeah, and I'm, interesting, I mean, I, I mean, a figure that is a appealed to sort of within different strands of black thought. So Booker T. Washington would usually be thought of on the more kind of conservative right. track. Uh, he's a huge admirer of Frederick Douglass. Uh, du Bois, uh, who's thought of on the more left-wing side of things, uh, also a hmm. huge admirer of Frederick Douglass. And there's, a, I think, a kind of, that, that continues today. Uh, I remember right, Al Sharpton criticized Obama for announcing his candidacy in Springfield and talking about Lincoln. He said, you should have come here to Rochester, New York, and talked about Frederick Douglass. That's interesting. Sharpton said, we've got to stop giving the wrong people credit for our history. That's not, I mean, I'm not sure he's right, but that's a fairly intelligent comment for, I wasn't aware Sharpton yeah. had that sophisticated interview, but that's interesting, actually. You can see that, you know, it seems so natural if you're just watching yeah. it as, you know, a white American, of course, why wouldn't you do Lincoln, Springfield? And it probably was the prudent yeah. thing for Obama to do, but that's, I can see that point from Sharpton, yeah. yeah. And so more, more attention to black agency. Yeah. Now be called black agency. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, well, freedom has to be fought for and earned, though. That's important. Yeah. And today, what do you, you teach it? I mean, you teach it to college students, and you've written so much about it. I'm sure it could uh, yeah, talks I do. about I it. Am, what do you find I am, people I included... respond to? What should they respond to? What could people learn that they, I mean, apart from just the amazing story, which is itself yeah. worth, obviously, yeah, I do think reminding that, oneself it, of. I mean, Students need more biography. Yeah. Uh, you know, political philosophy is good, mm -hmm. but <laughs> right. can be a little cold sometimes. Right. So I think it is good to have heroes. And now, especially that we're taking all these other statues down, and we have the empty plinths, uh, right. we should uh, we should put more more statues of Frederick Douglass up. Are there so, many? I mean, there's. Uh, there are some. Yeah, there's uh, a nice one outside the uh, in Easton, Maryland, on the eastern shore, uh, outside of the county courthouse. There, there's. Wow. Good one. There are a lot of murals of uh -huh. Frederick Douglass, uh -huh. not just in the United States, but worldwide. Uh huh. That's interesting. So, but yeah, I think I do think yes, it's important. It's important for him to be read by all Americans, not just by uh, African Americans, though they would have a special, probably, feeling about it. Uh, but we do divide up the history too much into these races and ethnicities. I, when I'm Jewish, I feel that they're great. You know, they're, <laughs> you know, they're great statesmen. I mean. Jewish statesmen who would be of interest, you know, some of the Jews read them, but, you know, they could actually, others could learn from them, and vice versa, obviously, in terms of, you know, it's, it's we are too, yeah. we segment too much, maybe. And what do you find when you teach Douglas? I'm just curious, any uh, yeah, special, well, notable reactions one are, way or the other? Yeah, uh, they amazed at his life story, but also, and I think somewhat disturbingly, they tend to say, well, okay, that's him. He was remarkable. And other people can't really imitate that. Hmm. So when they read about his reaction to discrimination, uh, there's a story he's um, removed from the rail car and forced to ride in baggage. And his white friend comes back and joins him and says, oh, you know, Frederick, I'm so sorry that they've degraded you in this way. And Douglas says, uh, no one can degrade Frederick Douglass. Right. They've degraded themselves. They have not degraded me. So in an age of kind of sensitivity and sensitivity training and hypersensitivity, when students encounter that, they're awed by it, but they say, well, that's inimitable. Right. <laughs> right? right. People can't really react that way. Right. Uh, only someone like Frederick Douglass could react that way. Right. So I... I actually I find that I find that disheartening that that that's their reaction to it. Uh, it seems to me if we took his reaction as more of a model and a model to be emulated. I suppose there's a tension between, and of course it's funny that it was a railroad car because that is the issue in um, Plessy v. Ferguson and and discrimination and travel and spills over discrimination everywhere else and if you want to write injustices you sort of have to claim that the injustice does harm does harm yeah that's and the so <laughs> there's a tension between making right. that claim and saying but i'm too proud or dignified or strong to be harmed i mean both are yeah it understandable does not, his view, douglas's view of that does not lead him to say okay we can be politically quiet about this and we don't have to agitate about it and we can put up with it and tolerate it because it really doesn't hurt us that much that's not his not his view so he's somehow able to combine yeah. those things, or he's able to give different messages to different audiences. Hmm. So what, what his, the message that Douglas always gives to a black audience is a message of inner resources, of self-help, of dignity and character and virtue and what those things can achieve. The message that he gives to white audiences is, you know, Get your own house in order. Stop doing this. Uh, we need to we need to reform these laws. Does he go so far as to say, which was a major theme, I think, of Kings, that this is also hurting you, the white master? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and in a way, that's what he's saying. They they have not degraded me. They've, They've degraded, degraded themselves. themselves. And actually, you can see that maybe more clearly in Booker T. Washington, who actually says these these things that are being done to blacks. He says they inconvenience us but they injure the white man. Says, uh, if any race uses its power to harm another race, they have 
permanently injured themselves in morals. And so Booker T. Washington says, it's, it's, it's for the white race that I plead. Hmm. <laughs> he, he presents, uh, it, it's an amazing act of, uh, both of sort of moral superiority right. and, uh, but, and of care. Uh, Booker T. Washington cares for the souls of white delinquents. And, and you do see a little bit of that in King, King at his best, mm -hmm. right? Where King says that by, by awakening the moral conscience, that he's not just speaking to sort of the rest of America, America watching this on the news, but he's speaking directly to the bigot and he's trying to... And I suppose the mixture of principle and prudence, or however one wants to put that in Douglas, is applicable, you know, mutatis mutandis in different circumstances. As a general matter of statesmanship, would you argue I mean, that he, he really had thought through where you that, need to stand and where you can compromise and so forth? Yeah, and, but I, I think that is a, it's, a, it's an evolution in his thought. I mean, clearly the abolitionists give nothing to prudence. The right. radical abolitionists, the Garrisonian abolitionists, nothing, nothing to prudence. And he rethinks that? As an adult, I mean, it's not, that's impressive, right? I mean, it's rare yeah. that, I mean, he's already kind of famous and he's giving speeches and then he sort of steps back and says, and is that right? I mean, and really yeah, does think, explicitly I almost I think change his view. Uh, right. So you see it in his, maybe partly there is a prudential element in his changing view of the Constitution, but only partly. <laughs> I think he really does mean it sincerely, but there is, there is a, that sort of right. prudential element in it. Uh, but it's really more in thinking through what Lincoln means hmm. that Douglas comes to an appreciation of statesmanship. Oh, that's great. So uh, you can see it in that 1876 address where he says, if you view Lincoln from the genuine abolition ground, he seemed tardy, dull, cold, and indifferent. And he put the he put he put the cause of white America first. Uh, but he says if you view him f from the ground of statesmanship, right? If you view him sort of from the perspective of white public opinion, which as a statesman Lincoln was obliged to consult, right? then he was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. Hmm. <laughs> that Lincoln, Lincoln was always one step ahead of public opinion, always moving and shaping public opinion in the right direction. But as a statesman, you can never be more than one step ahead of public opinion. So I think Douglas, in retrospect, really sees that about Lincoln and comes to appreciate it. And in that oration, he shows now black voters right, how they should think about white elected officials, hmm. how much latitude to give them, when you have to sort of tolerate certain sorts of expressions that you really don't approve of, cannot sign on to. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really remarkable essay. Yeah, that sounds uh, terrific. And it, and, it, and it has this movement because he sort of begins by saying, you know, Lincoln was not our president. He was not the black man's president. He was emphatically the white man's president. But by the end of the speech, if you follow the trajectory of the speech, the unfolding argument, he ends by calling Lincoln our friend and liberator. Right? So he shows sort of what the... That's good. Yeah. And that will have to... You've written so well on Lincoln. We'll have to have a subsequent conversation on Lincoln and then... And then uh, uh, that would complete the Lincoln and Douglas, the real, I, I the real Lincoln and Douglas, not the Lincoln-Douglas right. debates, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Two great statesmen. You actually I actually came to Lincoln through Frederick Douglass. Is that right? Yeah. Uh -huh. That's yeah, I, had, I didn't read either of them in any of my schooling. Well, well let's, let's, hope, let's hope this conversation <laughs> begins to correct that and that uh, people yeah. take a look at, at Douglas, obviously, and uh, we'll come back and do Lincoln sometime great. soon. Diana, thank you so much for taking the time Enjoy. to be here today. Uh, and thank you thank for you. joining us on Conversations.